Okay, so um, let's start. Um, I'm gonna just give a little bit of a quick intro about myself, um, and then basically talk about some ideas, thoughts, and experiences around product management. Um, and at the end, I'm gonna do an AMA, right? So I'm open for questions. So I, I, I put you there my uh, Twitter and my Medium um, URL. So I occasionally tweet and post some blog blogs. So uh, just feel free to like me, share me, clap me, make me part of your life. Um, yeah. So um, let's, um, let's go for this. Uh, I actually have a clicker. So uh, a quick intro. Um, I, was, uh, I was born in Argentina. And when I was a kid, I moved around a lot because my dad used to work in the United Nations. So I, I lived in Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela, back to Argentina, back to Venezuela. So I moved around a lot, uh, kind of mainly because I was uh, forced by unhelpful regimes. Um, so when, when I typically say that I have a two or three exits in my life, I typically mean it in not the cool Silicon way sense of the word, more like the one free life sense of the word. So I think this is good anyways, because this taught me a few lessons around uh, resilience and, and making do with what you have. And it's also, that's always very important when you're a product manager to be very scrappy and to use what you have to build great things. So when I was um, a kid, I was very much a tinkerer and I played with, like probably many of you, like with Lego and Meccano and played Prince of Persia and just discovered computers in the, in the late 80s and did a lot of coding and also discovered synths and did a lot of you know, electronic music, all weird stuff, which I'm relatively proud of. Um, but um, it, it, this is what kind of got me into the world of digital. I started building my first apps uh, when the App Store you know, came to life. And I had some luck with the first app. The first one I did was featured by Apple, and it was great, great success for one week until it fell down on the feature list. Uh, but there was definitely uh, just one way it would go in my life. So I, I do have a past in consulting, like Accenture and IBM, which uh, it's kind of obscure past. I don't want to remember, uh, but um, I, at some point in my life, I decided to go full, full um, throttle on digital. So at some point, I joined Telefonica and kind of trying to get into a bigger context. I, I was head of online and product director when I was in Venezuela. But again, kind of the con country was tanking, so I decided to do another exit. So that brings me to London in 2014 when I joined HSBC. So um, there's a lot going on in HSBC right now. When I joined, digital was this big. Now it's a much bigger organization, partly because we moved to a much better digs. We're now in Bluefin, which is actually a, goal, a cool place in Bankside. This is how you dress. If you, if you wear a suit, you're the one that looks funny. Uh, so we, it's, it's a really, it's a great place. You know, we got open spaces and nice terraces, which is actually, you, you got a pub at the top of that terrace, which is insane. So it doesn't have to be boring to work in a bank. And it seems like I'm doing a pitch. We're always hiring, guys. I got pamphlets. So if you want a job, just talk to me. Maybe we can arrange something. Um, so out of this good environment created where we are all working together in product and agile, right? Because these are new terms at the time, um, comes a lot of created ideas. So one of the first ones I was involved with is uh, maybe you heard of Connected Money, right? So Connected Money is a new app that we just launched, um, uh, which basically lets you aggregate accounts from all your banks and gives you an idea of your spending, your spending patterns, et cetera. So I was working on this since the beginning. I, the beginning was just me, and I actually had to code the, co the whole thing myself. Then we got you know, some interest in buying, and we got developers, and it ended up being a TV ad with the IT guy. And we actually put ads all around the place, and we made a massive campaign about this. And you, can, you should really download the app. It's pretty cool. Um, but then, a year ago, I moved from that project into mobile banking, which is kind of the app that everybody uses. If you're a HSBC customer, you will probably use the app that I'm product manager of. So these four la last four years have been really uh, crucial to some of the experiences I'm going to share today. Um, so that, that's why I kind of put some emphasis to tell you what the story was. Right, so let's talk about product management now. Enough of me. Product management is arguably the best job in the world, right? <laughs> Says a product manager. I think so because uh, you have the, the ability to create something that you really love 
and then make customers love it too. So you build stuff so that people love you, basically. Um, in reality, what you're doing is you, you, are, you have the, the power to create positive change in their lives. And this, this is not just like one person. I mean, typically we're talking about a lot of people that are in front of your product. And in the case of the product I lead now, it's millions. So it's a great power. You have a flick of a switch and you're affecting millions of people. If there is a bug that affects 0.1% of our audience, it's still a Wembley Stadium full of people. So it's, it's, a, it's a great power, but it's also a great responsibility. Um, and customers are really passionate about the product and they you know, give you a lot of feedback. So if you do something wrong, you'll get something, sometimes a lot of kudos, sometimes a lot of passion back. So it's, um, it's really hard. By the way, this is, this is all bleed end-to-end -end images, my presentation. There's some content. If you want to get some actual material, go to my Medium blog post and you'll get a lot more. So product management is very hard, right? Super hard. Um, so what I'm saying is you, you have to be good at it. Um, so you have to learn a lot to be good. And you have to continuously up your skills and be uh, up to date with the latest. Otherwise, you really fall back. So if you, if you do not try to push yourself to be um, you know, very knowledgeable of everything in the different disciplines, well, you're not going to last very long. So you have to be good. And there are vast resources you can use. So you can read books. And there's great you know, literature and podcasts. There's product school, of course, and people like me that tell you things that you should know. Um, but the hard truth is that the only way you really know how to learn how to build a product is by building one, um, which is kind of you know, contradicting. Um, you can try doing it at small scale, but you know, the reality is that a lot of the things that uh, are really crucial in this, um, um, in this profession, you learn on the road. So that's why I'm here to talk to you about things that um, kind of you learn by experience. So to begin with, let's talk about what the key is of the whole thing. The key. Well, before I talk about the key, um, one of the things you learn on the road is that this is a really counterintuitive occupation. And kind of, you know, your head explodes and we try to understand that getting yes from customers means saying no a lot. And that easy is really hard and simple is really complex and et cetera, et cetera. So, what is, what is the key to being a good product manager? Um, well, the key is that you are at the center of so many disciplines around you. And your job, really, is to kind of be the director that makes sure that these amazing people around you really work very effectively towards an outcome. So, I mean, the, the rest really, the, the rest is how deep you go into the disciplines, and we'll get to that. But if you're not understanding of the different uh, skills and challenges uh, of the team that you have working together, uh, go through, uh, then you probably won't resonate with their problems and you, get, you don't get the best out of the team. So, you lie at the intersection of these complementary human disciplines, and you are the driving force that makes every talent work together in symphony, in syntony, actually, <laughs> towards a clear purpose and a crafted outcome. And I'm quoting, you know who I'm quoting? I'm quoting myself. How sad is that? How lame is that? It's so lame. But, you know, I, I thought I was. So this is part of my, my blog post. I'm going to be quoting myself a lot today. Jesus Christ. <laughs> anyway, um, five things today. Let's talk about five key things. The story, the peeps, the depth, the trust, and the ego. Things you need to um, understand. So the story. Um, let's start with this. If you are a product manager, you are a writer of stories. You are a... Uh, you have crafted the art of storytelling and creating a narrative around the product vision of your product, or the vision of your product. So um, everybody loves stories, and everybody loves the fact that the stories have context and challenges and characters and outcomes. Uh, and we know that because we, you know, we are addicted to binge-watching series because this is what you know, drives and connects us with human emotions. Um, so what you need to do is you, ne you need to... Well, and by the way, stories, we take stories home. We take st stories to work. They stick with us. It has a very sticky element. So what you need to do is you need to, is you, when you're a product manager within your organization, small or big, you need to articulate your product vision as a story that has context, that has challenges, 
And it's basically like a sequence of events that happens that you're, you're, you know, the, the parties involved are part, are part of and they can feel invested with. Um, if, you, if you use the, 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 you know, the, the, the construct of a story, you can articulate that in a way that people can understand it. It's human readable. So you can go to the different areas of your organization, like in a roadshow, with your pitch deck that basically tells a tale that they can resonate with. A tale that you know, um, and describes where you are as a company today, uh, where you want to be in the competitive landscape, and what the different milestones must be that you need to go through uh, to achieve that outcome, and how everybody contributes to it. So vision as storytelling is really useful, and I've applied this a lot, and people really engage uh, with, um, with this articulation of, of, and this narrative of a, of a product vision. Uh, it has context and challenges and uh, the climactic output, a climactic uh, end state. Um, you can use this as a tool to get buy-in from different stakeholders around the organization, from your team, of course. Um, maybe even more importantly, yourself. You have to believe in the story you're telling. Um, you, you go on a roadshow and you share this uh, product vision with everybody involved. And the important thing maybe is that it's never a static thing. Um, as you get new data and as the industry changes and technology changes, your vision can also change. So think of it as a medium blog post and you can update after you're, you've published it. So it can be rewritten. This is not a dogma. Uh, it changes over time. So storytelling is a way of describing your product vision as a single construct that blends things together like context, possibilities, facts, and emotion into a, a conceivable sequence of events and it invites everybody to feel a part of it. And also, it kind of, it kind of requires you to have you know, some, some skills at communicating this to others. Um, and in, in the end, people react well with the, the person in front of the product vision is somebody who can have this ability to articulate a vision. Right, so um, the people. So people are amazing, right? We know that from YouTube. Um, but people really can make amazing things when they have the right tools and motivation. They can land vertical rockets, right? So it's, it's really, it's all about having the right um, leadership and the right understanding of what they do. So um, they, can, um, they can work together in collaboration. They can work together individually and in cross-pollination with other teams. So think of them Think of the talents that you have as you know, artists, scientists, and tinkerers. Um, think of them as superheroes with superpowers, right? Like the Avengers. So what do the Avengers need? Well, they need Captain America, right? They need somebody which is the true, provides true leadership. So you, in your role of product manager, are the one that has the product sense and the product compass and makes the hard choices around things uh, that you need to prioritize, trade-offs that you need to do, um, and, um, and you know, sometimes making uh, the, the hard choices of saying no when saying no hurts. Um, so it's kind of your responsibility and your accountability to be able to make some of these choices you know, in spite of all the work that has been done. Sometimes it's really dreadful to say, we're not gonna be able to launch this great piece of work we've done because we are not ready. Uh, so it's kind of soul crushing sometimes, but you kind of have to make those calls. Um, sometimes you make the opposite call, which is um, even though we're not ready, maybe we should ship it anyways on, in the understanding of the risks. We'll get to that. Right, so you got, you're surrounded by superheroes and with superpowers. Uh, they typically self-organize very well. You can leave and the orchestra keeps playing, uh, but they do need true leadership uh, to kind of get to the full potential. And you never get to the true potential instantly. Um, there's always a process where a team ramps up to a really, to high performance. And that doesn't really happen overnight. That's why Agile is really useful, because Agile provides uh, ways for teams to learn how to work and, and, and be more effective. You got retrospectives, you got a bunch of different ceremonies uh, where you can, you know, um, understand where the team is not being effective, where some processes are failing, and continuously improve it like it was a product. Yeah? So 
the good thing is that when you achieve that level of high performance, sometimes it might be exhausting or uh, stressful, uh, but uh, there's never a dull moment in this profession. And t interestingly, today I had a very, very exciting day from that point of view. Crazy things happened today in the office. Um, so um, everybody that goes through a process like this always remembers it, like probably the best times of their lives. So it's, it's always good to, to, to push uh, people to, do, to be at their best, provided you do it in a way that doesn't break everything, doesn't break the system. Um, and finally, it's, all, it's also about hiring. One of the most important things a product manager should do is be very much involved with the hiring. So the talents that you have kind of uh, inform the quality of the products that you will eventually ship. So when you do hiring, it's always competencies first and then culture. So competencies is basic. If you're looking for somebody to add value, um, you can't really compromise on that. And if you see, the only way you could compromise is that you found somebody that might not have the competencies, but you've detected raw power uh, that can be channeled and you might need to invest time in training and getting out to speed. Um, but it's kind of a risk. Typically, we look for competencies first and then culture. And by culture, we don't mean groupthink. Uh, we don't mean just people that dress and think like us. That's not it. Uh, you need con cognitive diversity and you need basically people that can work with others, that can share ideas, that can discuss and be open about uh, things they agree or they don't disagree on. It's also important to get the diversity. If you can, you don't need to force it, but if you can, um, you know, gender, gender, background, ethnicity, etc. Because you probably want to represent your audience within the team somehow. Uh, if you all have, you see, if it's all men, well, it's great, great engineers, but you probably also want the other side uh, to, to have a balanced view. Uh, you don't need to force it, of course, in the hiring at, at all, but it's, it's a good situation where you're all well equally represented. So um, hiring ensures the team is composed of individuals with cognitive diversity, so they can represent your audience and you know, come up with solutions that are creative. Uh, and when it comes to choosing from the pool, competencies, and then culture, yeah? Okay, so the depth. Um, so this is, again, I said this is a really hard job because you need to have what's called vertical mobility, high, high vertical mobility, where you go all the way up from the strategy and uh, the business outcomes that you need to provide because your stakeholders will speak in these terms. Um, to the very, very depth of the Marianas Trench, of the nitty-gritty details of the people you work with, because that's where you also make the difference. So you have to be able to go up and down uh, very quickly, because you're gonna have all these conversations daily. Um, the typical agenda of a product manager means talking to C-level people and then talking to the QA tester around a particular Jira ticket. So you need to be plugged into all the conversations of your team. Uh, conversations about anything and everything. Uh, and that means that you need to, well, first of all, you need to understand what people are telling you. Um, and it's good to know a little bit about it. It's much better to know a lot about it. It's much better to know a lot about how engineering works, how design works, how you make a release happen, how automation testing works, and how, you know, a myriad of other things, regulation, legal, uh, uh, legal elements. So if you, if you are plugged into the conversations, you get to understand what their challenges are, uh, what your team's challenges are, what, their, um, uh, what the complexity of their daily work is. Uh, so if you, you know, don't listen to those particular problems, then you can't have an effective team. So it seems like you have to have like a split personalities, but at least three main personalities inside your head. Well, the first one is kind of this hipster, crazy genius designer guy. Um, so you, as a product manager, you need to know what design is about. It's not just about a pretty picture. So design is about the process of coming with a solution to a problem. And design has, you need a team to do it. You need a team with different disciplines. You need a team that has researchers and service designers and et cetera, et cetera, UI, UX, et cetera. Uh, you need to make sure that you have people that do this. And more importantly, you need to know what your place is in that process. 
So as a product manager, you are, well, you kind of have the mandate um, to come up with a solution that fits uh, the problem. Uh, so you are totally, you know, you're totally allowed uh, to, you know, request additional designs that suits, suit your purpose. But you can't just say, I don't like a particular design. Uh, you need to provide, you know, much more uh, guided feedback uh, that probably go in the direction of uh, how that particular design solution fits within the principles of your product. So it has to be structured, otherwise the team cannot really action on it. So it's your job to know the intricacies, in, in, intricacies of how design works. You also need to know, be like a little bit of a hacker and understand what developers day to day is. So you will probably need to know what uh, different um, programming langu languages are, what the uses are, uh, what the challenges are. Uh, you need to know what a day in the life of a developer should be like. Um, um, because, well, you, you're the one that is requesting of them high quality output. So if you don't know what they go through, it, it's hard to request, demand that. So um, you need to be, uh, needs to be a hacker in your head. And finally, uh, there's the third of your, uh, the other third is about making sure that you have runway to deliver and that you know how to put a product live. Um, companies have different processes uh, to get a shippable product out to customers. And big companies have big and complex processes. So your job or a third of your head's job is to open uh, the path, clear the path, so that everything can go and line up straight into a release. So I'm not really saying that you need to do all this yourself. You don't need to design or code or release yourself. You know, the team and the disciplines you are surrounded by will do it but you need to be absolutely understanding how they operate so you can understand where the trade-offs need to be made. So you need to go deep and wide in all the conversations. That is essential to get an understanding of um, what your team is doing. Uh, you need to connect with the challenges and responsibilities that they have, are. Um, you kind of need to have a little bit of split personality and go deep into all of these disciplines to be more effective as a leader. Um, and at least the hipster, the hacker, and the hustler, right? That is the triumvirate, the trinity that governs it all. So a hipster, a hacker, and a hustler in your head, they sometimes agree. Uh, sometimes they conspire against each other. Sometimes you want a cool feature that is really cool, but then uh, the hacker says, well, but that's really difficult, and we should be fixing bugs instead. Um, and then the hustler says, we don't, can't even launch it now. It has to wait for a full another month. So basically, they need to have enough bandwidth in your head and tools to operate at high performance and collaborate. Cool. Now, let's talk about the trust. Um, AI. <laughs> what does AI have to do with trust? Um, well, before that, AI... Is a, is a buzzword. So I kind of always urge people, and particularly aspiring product managers, to not repeat too many buzzwords. Cool features, great UX, AI machine learning. AI is just better algorithms, right? We just now are tempted to use AI all over. Anyway, so we might be going into a world that is governed by machines, but today, fortunately, the reality is that this is very much a world run by people by humans, and human relationships are based on trust, right? Trust is very important. Um, trust is the foundation of love. It's great, this is the oatmeal, I love it. Anyway, within, within an organization, and you as a product manager, it's really essential that you build trust with everybody. Trust with your leaders, your stakeholders, your peers, and your team. And you can achieve trust by well, you don't achieve trust, you earn trust by being clear, uh, by being transparent, by being reliable, by having a lot of communication, frequent communication at all levels, uh, communication with, uh, you know, again, with your key stakeholders, one-on-ones with people that you work with. So this is all great and you need all that. But if there's one thing that is crucial for earning trust within a big, uh, big, small, medium, large, whatever organization, 
is predictable delivery. If you are not predictable at delivering, then you don't really uh, earn a level of trust. And well, to be predictable, um, this means, um, well, first of all, articulating what you're doing in a roadmap that has some timelines. Typically, a roadmap doesn't have fixed timelines. That's why we invented Agile, right? Fixed scope and fixed uh, time don't really mesh very well together. But a roadmap articulates sequence of events, as in the story you're telling. Uh, but when it comes close to a release, um, if there's something that's not going to be there for the release and there's some surprises, we just don't make it a surprise and make sure that uh, you know, try to comply with what you're expecting because you know, customers expect value, incremental value out of a product, but the business requires, expects incremental ROI. And their high order strategies are based on the fact that you are releasing digital features that will enable them. So you have to be predictable. And sometimes being predictable means taking risks. Uh, so product management is very much a, a risk uh, tolerance exercise where you, on the one hand you balance you know features you want to launch and the other one you need to understand the risks associated and the mitigations you rely on to do it um, so by understanding the risks that you have of launching something early and understanding uh, what the consequences can be and by really listening to the experts yeah, at least you get a sense of what um, the blast radius is in case of something bad happens. Because if something bad can happen, it will, right? So it's really important that you, you even though this might not, might not be the most exciting conversations you will have in your life, you do understand when, you know, IT security and legal and compliance and risk and other really, really knowledgeable teams around you tell you things uh, about, um, the product that you're launching. And when those risks are understood and sized, and you know what the impact is, then you can make decisions. Um, and also, when some of these risks materialize, then you have a, a way and a plan to act on them. So again, a lot of what product management is about is about creating and building, but it's also shipping. And shipping means you have a product you operate when you're live. And I have been in many our production support calls when something has gone not amazingly well in our app and we've had to respond uh, to you know risks being materialized um, and here's where it comes handy to understand what your team is talking about and, and the different mumbo-jumbo that they typically use <laughs> so if it's mumbo-jumbo to you you're doing it wrong you need to understand exactly what they're saying so if you're in a live war room in a situation call and we're talking about the need to uh, protect some services from degradation. So we need to enact the runway book clause 15 to shut down cervix as what XY said. You need to understand what that means, not just for the business or for your customers, but also for the regulator. We're in the financial industry are pretty heavily regulated. They can't just shut down stuff. So you need to know what this is because you need to know the consequences because you might need might, will be forced to make a split second decision uh, at 3 a.m. in the morning or 4 or 5 uh, and you ca it cannot be a surprise to you otherwise you're really uh, pretty ineffective. Right, so um, power, uh, trust powers human connections. Trust is about predictable delivery not storytelling. Though I just said something about storytelling both are important. Right? You need to tell a story and be predictable at delivering it. Um, trust extends to all your relationships. Um, again, very important to have different conversations, but frequent with leaders, stakeholders, peers, and your team. Um, it's important to understand what the expectations are of the product that you're um, managing and what the risks are for these deliveries as well. And finally, um, things go wrong, so you also need to understand the blast radius. What it what what will be impacted when you know things actually do. So trust comes from predictable delivery, not storytelling. Trust goes all around, and it works best when you extend to all your relationships, and you need to build trust with everybody. Cool. Now let's talk about the ego. 
So success is a great thing. Feels good. Uh, it creates spaces. It gives you the opportunity to grow. It seems like when you do one thing well once, sometimes you're given more things. You're given you know, more apps, more markets, more remit. It's really great. Um, uh, I guess the problem is that when you, when you start to become successful, you start beginning to think it's you. <laughs> uh, and you think you are the one with the power. Um, when really it's not exactly about you, you are just one element of it. Um, and it's not, it's not really the power you collect that you should be looking for. It should be the power of your ideas, which should you, be, you should be spreading in forms like product school. So the problem with success is also it breeds complacency, right? Uh, you, you think you've done it once, you think you have the formula to win, and you can't lose. And this is really frequent in people like product managers because, again, we are spread very thin in multiple disciplines. We want to go deep, we want to go wide. Uh, but sometimes we just don't have the time. We're time poor people. Or very time poor. So you, you, sometimes you build these models in your head about how things work. Uh, UX, th that's UX, that's how it works. Uh, re customer researchers will tell me the truth about designs, right? But sometimes these models are wrong. You have misinterpreted them, uh, they are ill conceived, and sometimes they even change over time. So it's really uh, important that you, you know, you don't build models that are really on on loose and not solid foundations because they can be totally wrong and you, you can miss the point in many of the conversations just by having these wrong conceptions. So two things. Um, it's, it's, uh, first, we talked about not the power that you collect, the power of your ideas. That's the way um, you become, uh, that's the way you overcome your ego by relinquishing power, if you will. Just let it go, just spread, talk about the right thing you need to talk about, not about you know, uh, bringing things closer to you. And second, um, if, you, if you have learned something which is wrong and your ideals and your vision have been, um, have been incorrect, you, you need to learn to be wrong. And you need to accept the fact that some things um, you need to change and I'm not saying you have to be wrong, because typically good product managers are, very, are always right or are frequently very right. Uh, but if you are wrong, you need to accept it and change uh, and accept that there, there's, you need to update your, your, your conceptions. So um, success creates spaces. It also breeds complacency. Um, it's not about the power of your ideas, but the power, of you, uh, the power of your ideas, not the power you collect. Uh, you have to learn to be wrong. You're not, uh, this is, there's no dogma in this profession. Uh, there's no dogma in this scientific world. You have to move past that and learn to change if you have and be honest about it. Um, and what that means is that you have to continuously learn and get good at being good. Um, what will get you far and make people remember you is the power of your ideas, not the power you collect. Actually, I'm actually quoting somebody else here. This is something uh, one, a great mentor once told me. I, I'm just gonna steal it. Ego is your worst enemy, so you need to learn to openly accept your misconceptions and move past dogma and not be afraid to be wrong. Um, right, so this is kind of the story I painted today. You are at the center of all these disciplines and you are the director of the orchestra that makes this into a beautiful symphony. Um, if you want to be a great product manager, you need to tell stories. You need to learn to tell stories that captivate everybody around you. Uh, have to captivate yourself. You have to believe in it, um, but your team as well. You need to constantly refresh them with the, with the latest season of this story is. People are awesome, they can do amazing things with the right leadership and motivation. Um, they kind of rely on somebody that provides a product direction and compass, and that's you, Captain America. Um, 
you need to go very much to the top and to the very bottom and move quickly around all disciplines. Uh, the hipster, the hacker, and the hustler in your head need to work together. Um, the, you need to do this in a kind of a predictable way so that you can earn the trust of the organization you work with and your team as well. Um, and whatever you do, try to always update yourself hit the refresh button on your knowledge and always continue to learn, continue to come to product school <laughs> to, to get the latest and read, con read books. I read books about product management all the time um, because things change and you need to be up to date. So you are a director at the intersection of disciplines, you present an achievable vision, achievable, as a story everyone believes in. You empower these superpowers that you have around you, superheroes, with, su with the right competencies and culture. Uh, you must have deep conversations with everybody around you, and it's tiring, and it takes a lot of time, and you don't have time, but you have to do it anyways. So deal with it. And you need to earn trust through, most than anything, uh, predictable delivery and you need not be afraid to be wrong if you're afraid to be wrong then you're too rigid and this needs to be a flexible discipline a flexible occupation and that's it that's what I had for you guys so thank you for listening and now I'm open for interrogation Anything. Yes. Okay, so the question is, if you as a product owner, do you get involved in the Agile ceremonies with your designers and developers? Well, yes, you have to. If you don't want to be the product manager that kind of sits in a corner and doesn't engage with everyone, you need to be in those stand-ups every day, single day uh, and because you need to understand what the pulse is of your team. You know, again, this is all about people. And even though you have a lot of other things to do, um, you have to do other things like, you know, go on a roadshow to present the vision and worry about budget and resources and create a roadmap that uh, solves for impossibly conflicting priorities. You still have to be there. And I strongly urge you that you are present in every single uh, Agile ceremony from the planning. Of course, you have to be there from the daily stand-ups to the retros to the mid-sprint reviews to whatever other form of uh, team communion uh, you have. I think they will appreciate it um, because that means that you have a really, you're approachable uh, and you're close to their problems. And also oftentimes you also are detecting what's happening as well. So it's a way of being aware of how the team dynamics is. So yes, do not miss any of them. If you can be there, appoint a, a delegate. At the very least, yes. I have to ask some more questions. So, <clears throat> what I also notice when you attend all the standups, uh, some teams behave not really well, so they tend to turn the standup into just reporting to the product owner, product manager, the status update. How do you balance this communication not to become just a status update, but rather for the team have have a fair discussion about their problems and issues? Uh, okay, so the question is, um, the stand-ups tend sometimes to be like a status update, uh, but not an opportunity to discuss what issues are around. Uh, well, actually, I think that's the right approach. You don't want to use the stand-up to, you know, vent or go into the details of something. That's why you stand up. It has to be short. And not everybody that I've known uh, that's been in a stand-up hates when it extends more than, you know, 30 seconds per person. 
So you keep the standups very short, the, whatever format you want, what I did yesterday, what I want to do today, or you do it based on tickets that are on the board, um, ticket number X, who's done it, you speak. And if there's an issue on a blocker, you mention it and then you move on and you write down what actions need to be taken. For the, for the other thing you're saying, for, for discovering issues within the team, well, you got the retro for that. Uh, the retrospective is the point where everybody, well, first of all, the sprint has ended, right? So you're fresh from the end, uh, the end of an increment of work. So you can relax for an hour or two. You probably need a facilitator to do it. And that's where you say, hey, guys, uh, what went right? What went wrong? What do we want to change? And you can use many me metaphors like the, um, um, anyway, uh, Scrum Masters are great at this. They have great artifacts that they use to kind of suss this out of the team. So yeah, don't expect the uh, stand-ups to be about problems, blockers, but not team issues. Is, does that answer? Yeah, but sometimes it's like they're not discussing problems and blockers for themselves. They rather just explaining you like overall status and not getting so basically they actually sometimes have to have separate discussion without you to go and be more technical yeah so that so the, the, were you saying that sometimes it becomes I some teams like that okay I know that not all things like that but sometimes just people just tend to let you in particular you know as a product owner so I've, I've done this year or I'll, I haven't done this year and they're not going into, you know, proper, like, communication. Oh, right. Uh, I th so, I, I think what you mean is, um, um, sometimes you need to go into more details and the stand-up's not the right place to do it? Yeah, but I feel, because I work with a lot of these teams, I feel that some people really getting together every morning and just telling each other what they're working on, what areas they're touching, so they, you know, all together they kind of do the sync up. Not just a bit on Jira status, because you always can go to Jira and see the Jira status mm -hmm. without the standard, right? But it's rather for the team to see up what's going on, who's doing what, who's blocking each other. But if, if you have a product or a metaphor, sometimes you just tend to update your Jira status, see that's it. Mm -hmm. And then you have to sync up separately in charts or emails mm -hmm. or wherever, so it doesn't always work. Well, me. <laughs> uh, no, I, I know what you mean. Um, I, I think you need to do a bit more than just attend the stand ups. Yeah. So at the very least, you have to. If you don't do that, then you know it's a little bit of a disconnect. Um, but um, you at least you have to find ways of getting uh, you know the details of what the people are doing differently. Well, I what I do is I just walk around a lot, and I know what everybody's doing, um, what most people are doing, and uh, I go to one designer like you know what's up with that or what's your latest thinking on this problem that we need to solve. And I go to the engineers and I talk to them about, you know, what are we, wh where are we in the latest, you know, resilience updates that we have included. So you do it by walking around, by not being, not disturbing them, of course, by going on lunch with them. But yeah, so product management is about being close to everyone and having, being part of the Slack channel communications if you use Slack or having face-to-face -face if you can. So if you want details and you, you don't want to feel alien to the stand-ups, well, it's kind of on you to get into the details. It's happened to me that I've been on travel for a week and I come back and I don't understand what they're doing. So, so I have to go into the Slack channels and read history of three days history to get back into the context. Oh, that's what's happening. Uh, typically, you also have your lead engineer, your lead delivery manager, your lead design guy that will basically feed you the basics. You need to know A, B, and C. Um, so yeah. Yes? Um, you know, uh, requirement management is very important for, for as a product manager. But sometimes, especially when you deal with the requirements with the stakeholders, maybe they are aggressive and they have a lot of, they keep adding the requirements for your product. Um, but you know there's some uh, time restriction. So how can you deal with the uh, requirement change? Yeah. Okay. So the question is, how do you uh, deal with scope creep or requirement changes? Um, okay. I think there's there's ways. So in in the experience that I have um, at HSBC, where I'm I'm in charge of apps, right? Mobile banking. Uh, we have like a past. And the present. The past is, we used to have 
um, d digital used to be driven by uh, more like business and IT, where the, the increments of digital products that IT did were like big chunks of six months or a year. So what typical business did when there was no product organization was, let's just write an enormous document with every possible thing we can conceive, and then we'll give it, ship it over to IT, and then a year later we're, we'll get something out. So some of that thinking has changed a lot. Some of it still remains. Uh, but if you are a product team that is um, predictable at having small increments, uh, then you can showcase to whoever is asking, to whoever your stakeholder is, that you know, we're doing a lot of things for you, but if something is, doesn't make a cut in a particular date, you have multiple windows coming after. So th that model changes very, the, the perception of urgency. Of course, if there is something very urgent, um, yeah, you, you can lock it into a particular time frame. And if something changes and there's scope creep, then the story is very simple. Um, what is the extra additional benefit of that additional thing uh, which if we don't do it in time, because we have a capacity and a velocity, um, if we don't do it in time, uh, uh, will you know, prevent us from launching the first version. So um, the idea of having small versions first and continual increments is a good tool to say, you don't need to put all your, bucket, uh, uh, all your eggs in one basket, uh, rather you need, to, um, you need to spread in that, those increments over time. And then you de-risk everything. You have something that adds value first and continuous increments.